It's nine o'clock. This is Sky News. Welcome to the show where I interview people who have something to say about the world today and how it's changing. They'll be from politics, sport, business, entertainment, public life, or they'll be everyday people caught up in the events of our times. I'll be putting my questions to tonight's special guests. Good evening. The war in Ukraine has brought devastation across the country. Whole towns have been flattened, thousands of civilians killed and battles raging. But could there be a glimmer of hope on the horizon? Negotiations this week led to Russia saying it will pull back on attacks on the capital, Kiev. One man has been on the front line protecting his city, Vitaly Klitschko. He was once a heavyweight world boxing champion. Now he's mayor of Kiev and he has the fight of his life on his hands. He's speaking to me tonight. There's the war of bombs and bullets and then there's a shadow war of spies, lies and information. One of Britain's spy masters, the head of GCHQ, says Putin isn't being told the truth by his security chiefs. But who can we believe? I'll be putting those questions to Christopher Steele, former British intelligence officer, author of that infamous dossier on Donald Trump. He has spent his life observing the comings and goings of Russian spies. So he should know what's going on. Whether he'll tell us, we'll see. Also tonight, in 2020, the discovery of a terrifying new virus changed the world as we know it. Cities and countries went into lockdowns, but little more than a year later, there were vaccines available. It was a truly stunning achievement, led in Britain by a businesswoman none of us had heard of before, but we know her now. It's Kate Bingham. I'll be asking her how it all unfolded and whether we're prepared for the next one. Let's get straight into our first interview tonight. Vitaly Klitschko first made his name as a champion boxer. He turned to politics in 2005 and became the mayor of the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, in 2014. But he never imagined he'd be defending his city and his people from an invasion by the Russian military. A little earlier, I spoke to Vitaly Klitschko, the mayor of Kiev. Vitaly, first up, thank you so much for sparing some time to talk to us when you are in the middle of what you're in. Let me start with the military situation now in Kyiv. Putin has advanced on the city, but he's failed to capture it, and nor has he at the moment sought to flatten it with shelling. And Moscow's now saying it doesn't want to put Kyiv at military risk. Are we at a stage yet where you feel you could say that Kyiv is safe? Uh, first of all, it's, uh, nobody feels himself safe uh, in uh, Ukraine. If you're in Ukraine, are you sorry in danger? Second point, uh, right now, the huge battle. We're talking right now and listen, it's uh, explosion. Explosion, uh, it's battle right now north of the city and east of the city. So you can hear uh, that where... now outside? Yeah, I hear right now outside this explosion. Explosion uh, because in uh, uh, Irpin, uh, Borodyanka, Gastomil, uh, right now, right now they is fighting. It's uh, near to Bravary. It's a small city, sat satellite city of uh, Kiev, and that's why right now they circle around uh, the, the, the uh, Russian, Russian uh, army will move back, and uh, they moved, uh, but uh, still danger, and we listen all day the explosions. V Vitaly, when the Russians say then that they tell us and we hear these press conferences where they say that they are switching attention away from Kyiv uh, and they are moving their forces elsewhere, you don't see evidence of that, you don't believe that's what they're doing? Please don't believe Russians. It will be biggest mistake. Uh, they told it's not we are in Donetsk, Lugansk, it was not true. 
They told they don't want to war uh, against Ukraine. It's not true right now. Right now, the occupation of Ukraine, the Russian um, uh, Russian uh, forces uh, make for a war. It's not true. Right now, the Russians told they uh, go away. It's not true. The battle is there. Maybe some part of um, um, forces move to another uh, uh, side of Ukraine, mm. but they still around. Kiev. And Vitaly, I think we've got some pictures. I want to show you some pictures that we've been seeing here in the UK. I don't know if you can see them. We have one of Mariupol. This is Mariupol. This is from a drone. And then we also have some pictures from Irpin, which is not that far from you. When you see these pictures, how, how does it make you feel? It's it's painful to see these pictures. The city doesn't exist anymore. The whole uh, uh, building is destroyed. The city is destroyed. And uh, it was a couple of months ago, it's a great part of our city is where uh, very comfortable life. And uh, it was privileged to live in a satellite city to near to Kyiv. Right now, the, the city not exist anymore. Right now, we are collecting the, the bodies, the people who uh, killed from Russians. Vitaly, when you when you see those pictures of, of of other parts of Ukraine, are you fearful that this could happen to Kyiv, or do you think that the Russians would not dare uh, to bomb the capital in that way? I have a feeling. I have a feeling the Russians doesn't have uh, some uh, some um, moral protection or I don't know. It's uh, they killing civilian, mm. they uh, killed children, women, they destroyed Mariupol, mm. destroyed uh, more than fifty percent of buildings in Kharkiv, totally destroyed. It's apartments building. They destroyed half of um, uh, Chernigiv. It's uh, 150 kilometers, around 100 miles from Kyiv. And uh, I guess they can't uh, use any uh, weapons. We're uh, talking right now about the chemical weapons. The Russians already used that in Syria. Mm. And uh, if a couple of months ago somebody Tell me, is uh, what I think about the war? I will be. Uh, I I never expect mm. in the modern time in Europe we have huge war. This war is biggest one after the Second World War. And uh, if a couple of months ago I tell it's impossible, but right now. You right now, ask. right now, if you if you ask about our hometown, it's everything possible if we look on Mariupol and Harkin. Mm. Just on on life in Kiev at the moment, it's hard for us to understand what it's like there because what we see is the reports focused on war. Can you describe what it's like in Kiev at the moment? Are you? able to go to shops? Are cafes open? Are kids going to schools? How are you living at the moment? Uh, before, the, the, before the war, just two months ago, uh, one and a half months ago, the population uh, of uh, our city uh, was three and a half million people. We are one of the largest uh, cities in East uh, Europe. Uh, right now, we guess uh, health population is uh, women, children already left. The majority right now, the men who are ready to defend uh, our city. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Li the life, um, we, it's actually it's a war destroyed the logistic, uh, war destroyed the uh, normal life and the people. And uh, right now, the uh, streets is empty. It's a uh, blog post with web uh, with people uh, with uniform uh, with weapons, territorial defense. But uh, slowly, uh, listen, uh, Ukrainian, listen, uh, the Russian forces uh, a little bit far from Kyiv, 
but everybody want to get want to game uh, back to city they want to it's come personal back. They want to... it's uh, i talk to many people everybody want come to back but it's personal decision of every families for everyone but uh, the it's personal risk for everyone who come to Kyiv. Mm. We see, we hear we listen explosion uh, every day, and uh, the risk uh, to die is pretty high. And that's why my personal advice for everyone uh, who want to come, please uh, and, take a little bit more time. And uh, let's see how. Situation will be developed in the next couple of weeks. And Vitaly, your family, your, you have children, you've got three children. Do you see them or have you had to send them away? I mean, presumably you are at risk personally because the Russians have you on their hit list. Uh, my brother is to get Vladimir is together with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I send my mom and Vladimir send his daughter outside of the country. It's, uh, right now, this uh, family, it's uh, outside of the country. So it's, you, haven't uh, much seen more your, safe. you haven't seen your family for weeks? M more than months. That's really hard. That's really hard. Um, you are on the Russia hit list. President Zelensky, we know about assassination t attempts on him. Have there been assassination attempts on you? It's everyone in Ukraine in danger. Mm. Uh, oh. Everyone, every citizens of Ukraine right now in Ukraine uh, have risk. Uh, I come from a military family. My father, former officer, uh, he's actually died uh, and spent his life to defend the people in Ukraine in uh, by Chernobyl. Um, uh, nuclear uh, catastrophe, what ha Ukraine have 1986. Uh, father study me and my brother is big privilege. I am former soldier also. It's big privilege for every man to give his life as defender of your country. And that's why we are not afraid. Nobody wants to die. But it's our home. So you're not it's our hometown. You're, you're, it's our families. It's our children. We defend our children. We defend the future. We don't want to live in the country, in the in Soviet Union. We don't want back to USSR. Mm. We don't want to live in the country where is no human rights, where is no uh, press freedom, where is no rules. I'm talking about the Russian Federation. Mm. Because the Putin, the goal of Putin to rebuild Russian empire and uh, to occupy Ukraine and uh, to to rebuild Soviet Union, we was in USSR and we done back in the past time. And Vitaly, you are clearly prepared to die for your country. I think you're saying to me, if you lose your life, you are not afraid. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die. Uh, uh, I tell you some uh, example. I uh, uh, train uh, every day. I go to uh, the, every districts of our city. I stop in by blog post and uh, civil defense. I am very surprised. The people with very peaceful profession. Uh, for example, musicians, actors, doctors, right now, they stay with uniform. They never, they never expect to take the weapons in the hands. Mm. But right now, they want to defend his city, mm. hometown. And uh, we, we always was peaceful nation. Mm. Is we Ukraine is peaceful country. We never was aggressive to anyone. But right now is a question about our future, future okay. of our but, children, but and Tali, we have to defend. Vitaly, can I ask you just quickly about your future? Putin clearly wants to take the Donbass region and some of the south of the country. Could you live with Russia taking some territory from Ukraine in order for peace? 
Russians right now starting to talk about some compromise. What about we talk? I don't know. Uh, compromise to give the Russians uh, some part of our territory is compromise, is job. Uh, the compromise if the Russians killed thousands of Ukrainians and right now we have to find the solution. I don't know what we talk about, what we, what we have to talk about. And uh, that why, that why, just one wish. Russians go away. Russian soldiers have to go away from our home country. And after that, we're ready to discuss. We understand the Russian um, uh, army is much stronger than the Ukrainian. It's actually Ukrainian soldier, Ukrainian army destroyed mythos about strongest Russian strongest army in the world. I explain you why Ukrainian so tough because Russian soldier paid they fighting for the money ukrainian soldier ukrainian citizens fighting for the future of our children are you feel the difference between the money and the children okay. and vitaly i have one final question for you then you're clear that you are not going to let putin take any ukraine territory what about president zelensky's suggestion uh, that Ukraine could perhaps uh, have a compromise at committing to neutrality and maybe putting that to a referendum to the people. Is that something, as the leader of the capital, you could live with? Uh, first of all, I am not involved in negotiation process between Ukraine and Russia. No, but what do you think? Uh, second point. Okay. Lead we doesn't have uh, the final uh, document uh, that's why we don't know what we talk about i am I'm, I'm not ready to give the commentary about that uh, and uh, also the referendum uh, natural status we was always natural country we want to be the part of european family it's our decision we want to be democratic modern country it's our decision and to take away our wish, it's not fair. It's we decide and we have, uh, we need to be someone who take a decision regarding, regarding negotiation and referendum. I don't know how we make the referendum in, in the war. Big part of Ukrainian right now outside of the country, they is uh, moved. Uh, they to safety place uh, in during the war. We have a lot of questions and not so many answer for that. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, let's see the negotiation uh, document. Uh, the uh, uh, let's see uh, negotiation uh, letters. What uh, uh, what uh, make. Uh, both sides, and after that, we can discuss about that. Okay, Vitaly Klitschko, thank you so much for spending some time uh, to talk to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Vitaly Klitschko, there. Well, coming up after the break, we'll get the thoughts from a former spy, Christopher Steele. Welcome back. The British intelligence agencies have been watching Russia closely for decades and since the Ukraine war started they've got their finger on the pulse of the Kremlin or at least that's what they want ours and the Russians to believe. Only last night the head of the British intelligence agency GCHQ said Putin doesn't know what's going on because his closest colleagues aren't telling him the truth. But is all of this disinformation? My next guest says no. Christopher Steele thinks British spies do have a good idea of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, and he should know, because for many years he was one of them. He joins me now. Chris, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Before we start to talk about all things Kremlin, let's kick off with Vitaly Klitschko and that interview. You just watched it. What, what did you make of him? Thank you for having me on the programme, Beth. Uh, delighted to be here. I think people like Vitaly Klitschko will be remembered for decades, if not centuries, 
as the real heroes of this period of our history and of Ukraine, of course, and a remarkable man, incredibly brave, living in a city which is under siege, which he's possibly being targeted for assassination. I think we absolutely have to take our hat off to him. He smiled and didn't answer that question, but you think he will have been targeted for assassination without doubt? I think in, originally when this operation was underway, yes, yeah. definitely. So a man that really is risking his life uh, every day. Um, let's get on to uh, the Kremlin and intelligence. So Jeremy Fleming, the boss of the uh, GCHQ, uh, said Putin has made a strategic miscalculation. He said this in a speech last night, launching this invasion. He said his advisers are afraid to tell him the truth. Is that your assessment too? I think that's part of the problem that you have in an authoritarian system where there is definitely not a premium on passing bad news and real news back up to the leadership. However, I think there's a more fundamental point here, which is that Russia has always had bad intent in terms of rebuilding its empire and dominating its neighbours. And it's never had the capabilities to match that. And I think the mis big mistake that Putin's made in this situation, of all the mistakes, and there are many, is that he believed that Russia had the capability to fulfil its mm. intents towards Ukraine, and it doesn't. And, and, and had an ability to do that quickly, and that hasn't happened. And I guess my next question for you is that that has clearly caused discord in the Kremlin. The Russian defence minister vanished with heart problems. What's going on? Are they all fighting each other? Churchill once said that studying the Kremlin was like looking at bulldogs fighting under a rug. You couldn't quite see what was going on, but you could hear the growling and the snarling. And it is very much like that. And mm. one of the problems we've got in, in assessing Russia over the years is that it's not an open society. It is, a, it is a complex society. The leadership is not uniform, it's not monolithic, but it is suppressed and the divisions are kept behind the scenes. The FSB, the Russian intelligence services, though, presumably they are leaking information to the Ukrainians. Is that partly why the Ukrainians are fighting more effectively? Is that partly why people like Vitaly or President Zelensky, despite having uh, been on Putin's hit list with mercenaries in the capital, that they're still alive? Is that what's going on? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that Ukraine and Russia are like England and Scotland or England and Ireland and that many Russians are of Ukrainian origin and vice versa. They're incredibly close, these people, and therefore the, the sight, the thought of destroying your cousin's uh, house and home and cities, and after all, Kiev was the first capital of the Russian state, is pretty horrendous mm. to a lot of Russians. And I suspect loyalty in that situation is very complex and difficult. Today, you, the UK's military chief said that while he expects the coming weeks to be difficult, that in many ways, Putin has lost. Do you agree with that assessment? Yes, I don't see there's a way back for Putin. And I think this is one of the big problems that the West is going to face going forward. I don't see how we can trust Putin in any sort of peace deal that comes now. And I don't see how we can deal with him in terms of normal business going forward. After all, the president of America has called him a war criminal. If you can't trust Putin, though, in any peace deal, how does it end? Because presumably it has to end with some sort of deal. I mean, Zelensky's talking about neutrality and a referendum. I mean, how does it end if you can't trust anything he does and you can't negotiate? I think it does end in a deal of some sort. Um, but I think that that deal is some way off. And I think it probably doesn't include Vladimir Putin. Um, what do you mean by that, Chris? Well, I think he, he may well be pushed aside out of the top leadership or even possibly assassinated by his own people. The, the point is that, that we've gone over a watershed here. I don't believe there's any way back for Putin. I can't believe he can be rehabilitated in the international community. And that's a big problem for us going forward. It also means he has no incentives to stop fighting. I think that's true, unless, of course, they start losing on the ground. And one of the remarkable things about this situation now mm. is it does look as though the Russian army, at least in some areas, is being defeated. And just finally on this, um, Tony Radekin has said Putin failed to anticipate the unity and cohesion amongst free nations of the world. Are you worried that this Western unity would crack if Donald Trump returned to power? 
in the US? Well, that's not an immediate prospect, um, actually, in this situation. There's at least another two to three years before there's a presidential election in America. It certainly wouldn't help. I mean, whatever one thinks of Trump, he was much more of an isolationist than other US presidents. He questioned NATO's existence and, and solidarity and the EU and all the institutions that stand up to Russia would, were put into question by him. Mm. And Chris, you, you're a Russian expert. You've studied and gathered intelligence on the Kremlin for many years. You now run a private business doing something similar. Were you surprised when Putin invaded Ukraine? I was surprised at the scale of the invasion. I wasn't surprised that there was a military operation or a political operation to recognise the breakaway republics as independent. But I had calculated, and others had calculated, that the logistics of this didn't add up. Oh. That if you cannot keep down a population of 43 million people using only 150,000 troops, it doesn't work. So poor intelligence from the Russians? I think poor advice. I think poor intelligence in terms of what I think Putin was being told, which was that parts of Ukraine would welcome the Russian troops with open arms, and there was a shadow governance structure that could be brought in to replace the current government. And you said in your submission to the 2018, this is the Intelligence and Security Committee uh, within Parliament that look at uh, matters of national security. You said uh, that Russia was becoming more aggressive, that it was moving from an authoritarian to totalitarian state, and that... Uh, Putin had to be tackled. Was the West asleep at the wheel? Are we partly to blame for this? Yes, we are very largely to blame for it, in my view, some of which is perhaps understandable. After 9-11, for example, there was an attempt to draw Putin into an anti-Islamist alliance, anti-terrorist alliance. That failed. But I think subsequently to that, the problem has been that the West has been naive about Putin and very slow to react to his rogue state type activity. And on the issue of how the West has reacted to Putin, I want to ask you a bit about the relationship between the UK and Russia and about oligarchs and money, Russian money in London. In the UK for years, you were monitoring Russia and the misdeeds of its spies, like murdering people uh, in the UK. And yet you also saw British politicians and businessmen, they go into parties and holiday in with oligarchs. Do you think that the establishment here let, let themselves get seduced? Absolutely. I think there were the two things going on there. One is a element of naivety, because many of the Russians who come to London are very urbane, very convincing, very sort of westernised. Uh, they don't represent the real Russia, if you like. There is a dark side to Russia which not many people understand. Sadly, I've been studying it for the last 20 years. Um, but I also think, in addition to that, Russian money, a wall of money that hit London, it wasn't just Russian, but it was Russian money first, I think, sort of set up a, a lobby, a group of interests who serviced this elite, who the lawyers, the estate agents, the PR firms and so on. And it became a pretty important part of our economy. And I suspect also in terms of investment and so on, particularly after Brexit and what have you, when we were looking for other forms of investment in the country. This golden visa scheme, which is now mm. so controversial and in retrospect was such a bad mistake, grows out of that problem. And there is one person that's particularly been talked about lately, which is Evgeny Lebvedev. You said in an interview with Sky last October with Sky News, it was curious Mr Johnson, Boris Johnson, had enabled the son of a KGB officer. Now, it's important that I make it clear Lord Levedet is a British citizen, has broken no laws, has condemned the war in Ukraine and strongly denies any insinuation he's sympathetic to the Russian government. But his elevation to the laws has been controversial. Would you like to see the intelligent reports around the decision to make him a Lord and put him into the House of Lords? Yes, there's a parliamentary procedure involved here, which is quite complicated, and I do understand need for confidentiality and so on. But this is such a controversial appointment. And the story out there is that it was against the advice of the security services. So I think it's a pretty exceptional case. And there was a debate in Parliament the other day, and I think probably the outcome of that should be more transparency about how this decision was made. You have some experience. Would you think that 
that has credibility that the security services would have been anxious about this appointment? I think any sort of family member of a former KGB uh, officer or a KGB agent, and actually Lebedev is not the only one. There are quite a few former KGB officers who are quite prominent in Britain and in business here who need to be very closely looked at. And certainly mm. it's surprising to me that they've managed to operate in the con this country in the way that they have. Well, it is now changing, of course, with these huge sanctions against a number of different people and companies. Can I now bring you just to the world of spies? Because is it fair to say that people are right not to trust intelligence sources? It's often disinformation. You often use anonymous so sources. Yet we're all expected to be reverential about British intelligence. Do you accept that you offer us no truth or proof in anything you say? I think that's an exaggeration. Clearly, intelligence work is as much an art form as it is a science. And what you're trying to do in intelligence work always is to test out a piece of information, get it from different sources, get it from different types of sources. I think that actually the calling out of this invasion by Western intelligence has been a remarkable operation. And I think that the, the decision to preempt to make intelligence public in this situation, mm. to preempt Russian activity, has wrong-footed the Kremlin quite a lot. Th that, that was interesting, wasn't it? Because what happened was things like uh, the invasion, the planning of it, then, you know, the threat of chemical weapons. What's happened is Western leaders who would typically keep that all private have been shouting about it and making it public. What's the tactic of doing that? It's the information warfare. I mean, the, the reason that intelligence often isn't made public is obviously because of the need to protect sources and techniques. And every time you make a piece of intelligence public, you are taking certain risks in that regard. However, in this situation where you're dealing with strategic threat, the invasion of a European country by Russia, the decision was obviously taken that that risk was worth taking. And I think it's paid off. But it's fair to say as well that British intelligence officers would also deal in disinformation as Russians would, right? It depends how what you're talking about. I mean, if you're saying that we should be spreading disinformation to Russian troops on the battlefield in Ukraine, probably yes. If you're talking about disinformation about our own society, obviously not. And Chris, how does this end? You've, you've said that you think that Putin, there's no way back for him, that there would have to be some sort of regime change in Russia, although how that could happen, still pretty opaque. Klitschko said in that interview that he was worried or he warned Europe, the rest of Europe, uh, that there is a danger that this tips into a wider European war. Do you agree with that? Are you fearful about that? Yes, I think... People talk in terms of this being like Munich in 1938, 1939. It's probably equally threatening in terms of 1914, where we sort of slipped into war by various mistakes in smaller countries, provoking bigger countries and so on. So there's always a risk that something like this can spread. And, you know, the, the polls are very robust. They've talked about having Ukrainian fighter aircraft uh, in their country or provided from their country. So it's very important that NATO remains united. Everyone sticks to the same script. Everyone sticks to the same rules about this in order to prevent this conflict spreading. OK, Chris, I've got more questions for you, but I have run out of time as ever. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, on the show. Well, look, stay with us. Coming up next the former head of the UK Vaccine Task Force, Dame Kate Bingham. Welcome back. The pandemic changed our world as we know it. We were told by the government time and again that the only way out of some of the most draconian restrictions ever seen in this country during peacetime was through a vaccine. My next guest was working as the head of the UK Vaccine Task Force in 2020, securing the jabs that were still in development and setting up a plan that would make the UK a leader in vaccine rollout. Earlier, I spoke to Dame Kate Bingham. Dame Kate, your task doing the Vaccine Task Force was to source a vaccine, scale up capacity, build capability in vaccine development, then make for the provision of 
international distribution and then strengthen the UK's capability for resilience for future pandemics, which actually sounds exhausting just reading it all out. Um, there's so much to talk about about that and also about uh, future proofing against pandemics. But if we kick off with what you did in the vaccine task force, what was the single biggest lesson you learned in that whole process? I mean, the single biggest lesson was probably getting the right team together and having a clear mandate and empowering the team to actually do the work that we needed to do. Because everything was in a rush, because every day we took, more people were going to die. So the first thing we did um, was to actually put together the experts from industry together with the experts from government and agree this is the strategy and this is how we're going to do it. And because there was so much uncertainty, what we did is put in place a very uh, focused um, set of meetings three times a week so that we at least had a framework with which to actually start communicating what we were doing mm. and talking about progress. So getting that team together, uh, getting a diverse team together, actually. So we had plenty of women uh, who brought real depth of skills alongside uh, the men we had in the team. Uh, in terms of learning, diversity of skills, people, thinking, mm. backgrounds, uh, made for a really effective team. And without the team, this couldn't have happened. Now it was a success. It's transformed everyone's lives that the vaccine rollout worked and the vaccine was found. But when you were contemplating this at the beginning, did it occur to you that you were most likely going to fail? I knew it was most likely to fail. Um, and there were so many reasons why it was likely to fail. The first thing was that we had no vaccine against any human coronavirus. So we had no template or playbook to follow. The second thing was that vaccines historically take five to 10 years yeah. to develop. The quickest was at four years, and that was done four, uh, 50 years ago. Um, and we didn't know anything about this new virus. So we had so many reasons to be skeptical that this was possible and to be able to uh, go from sequence to start vaccinating people in a year, which is what we did, was not what we expected to do at the beginning because we knew that most vaccines fail. You're obviously a very successful person. Was there a moment you thought, this is kamikaze, I'm, I'm setting myself up for failure? How did it come about that you uh, took the helm? The reason I was asked was because Patrick Valance um, had set up an expert advisory group to advise the government mm. on the procurement and identification and procurement of vaccines. Um, and he then invited me to join that advisory group. And my job for the last 30 years has been to develop novel uh, drugs uh, to treat unmet diseases. And so when Patrick then asked me to join the expert group, I asked him why, since I don't know anything about vaccines. Um, and he said, but you understand the small company uh, landscape. And it's that innovation landscape, which is actually where the bulk of the vaccines have come from. So he brought you in because he knew you from industry. But then the Prime Minister personally called you up. Correct. And asked you to do it. Everything's done by text. Okay. So you get a text saying, can you speak? So I first got a text from Matt saying, could I speak? I then spoke to him and he then said, the Prime Minister had asked him to ask me to do it. Mm -hmm. I then said, I want 24 hours to think about it. And 24 hours later, I went back with a list of conditions on the, the basis of which I would do it. Mm. And having established that, then the PM called me. And that was to seal the deal then, really? That was to basically accept the conditions, which was six months that I reported to the PM that uh, I would have a quick decision-making process, um, that I could hire my own team to mm. be able to get on and do it. I mean, did you have this moment you thought, I am, I'm going to fail, this is awful, I've been asked to do something, I've got to do it because the PM's asked me, I'm in the middle of a pandemic, and I don't know if I can do it. So, the, 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 absolutely, um, I had that entire imposter syndrome, you know, I can't do it and I'm not the right person. Um, and that was because I'm not an, a vaccine expert. And the, so, but while I do therapeutics, so, what I'm very familiar with is how do you develop new drugs and in patients. But those are for patients who have a disease. Putting something into people who are healthy volunteers is just a little bit mm. different, prophylactic mm. vaccines. And so when I was called, I hooked on the vaccine as being, this is what they're wanting me for. But actually, they're not. They're what, what they want is someone who can do basically what venture capitalists do, yeah. which is put teams together, build plans, uh, figure out milestone-based events which, you, which are key to actually the success of the development of, of, of the 
whether it's the therapeutic mm. or a, a vaccine. Um, and so there's lots of the style of how venture capitalists work is what was needed here. And the venture capitalist mindset and then Whitehall, they're kind of different, culturally different, very different things. You presumably met quite a lot of resistance. That's my first question. Then my second question on this is that, is the venture capitalist mindset only applicable in the public sector when it's an emergency situation? So two questions. On the, did I meet resistance? Not really, is the answer. So I had uh, absolute uh, support and cooperation from the PM. And actually, if you've got that top level leadership, it is incredibly helpful. Right. And I established up front that we were going to be putting uh, money at risk without knowing if any of these vaccines would work. So it's what the, what the um, Whitehall calls no regrets funding. Right. And so we'd established the principle that if we wanted a vaccine, we were going to have to put money up front. There was a lot of scrutiny around you, the fact that you were married to a Treasury Minister. You know, you know, it was all these sorts of this charge about being part of the chumocracy, if you like. And there you are doing this incredibly hard job uh, for, for, and not being paid to do it. Did you ever have moments when that happened, thinking, I've put myself, I've been asked to do it, I've stepped up to do it, and now I'm being publicly criticised? You didn't really have a right of reply. Did you just sometimes think, why have I bothered doing it? Like, why the hell am I doing it? Did it annoy you? Of course it annoyed me. Um, the, the challenge is, um, this all happened um, just only a few weeks before I was due to finish. And by then, we'd put it all in place. Yeah. Had all that happened early on, um, yeah. it might well, we might well have ended up in a different place. But what, by you the, might have walked, you mean? Or it just may not, we never would have achieved what we achieved. The advice I got, um, was incredibly clear, which is take your ego out of this, focus on what you're doing and, and move on because this will all pass but over. Did it and it did. did yeah, it of course it did. Yeah. It's very bizarre when, you, when you're not used to being in that world to have a whole lot of people say a whole lot of lies about you and you can't respond. I mean, it's really bizarre. Lily Allen has a great song. And so I used to go uh, running in the dark with a head torch on, listening to Lily Allen, What's, and it was great. And I'm not going to say the name of the song in public. Will I be able to guess it? Yeah. I watched your Romano's lecture. You gave it in Oxford in 2021. And you spoke about how your father, your late father, Lord Bingham, had been honoured giving that lecture. 19, was it 19 years before you gave yours, or 18? It was one yeah. or the other. And, and, and you talked about... You, you spoke about how he talked about... Um, the vulnerability of personal freedom in times of crisis. And then I saw you, you paused um, and you, you needed to kind of collect yourself. And you, when you spoke about your dad, what was, what was in your mind at that moment? Um, I just I caught mum's eye, who was okay. sitting in the front row. And, you know, I would practised it and I'd said it so many times. So it wasn't as if I was saying it for the first time. But then seeing mum sitting there, that's what absolutely oh, okay. uh, triggered me. So I then had oh, to say, was, just stop. And it was just... actually, I mean, it was actually a lovely moment, you know. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it absolutely. <laughs> but it was unexpected for me. But Well, incredible that you fo followed your dad as well. And one other question about him. As I said, he was widely regarded as the greatest lawyer of his generation, one of the most senior justices in the land. Um, how, how did he influence you, your dad? Uh, uh, not to go into the law. <laughs> okay. So I went and did... I mean, I was very keen, uh, I think, to carve my own path, and that's why, why I ended up in science. Yeah. So no, nobody else in my family does science. Uh, nobody else does sort of small businessy innovation, risk, that sort of thing. So I think I'm just a, you know, a maverick. Right, let's quickly get on to future pandemics. COVID, is it over? What we know is we, are, we had Delta um, variant that was really very serious last year. We're now in the middle of Omicron. Mm. Um, this could continue to evolve um, and out you know, new variants could outcompete. The question is, will it ultimately end up as a seasonal flu type mm. disease? And we hope that is where it will end up so that there's sufficient levels of immunity that we won't have this. Well Kate, I mean, Patrick Valance, when I've gone to the press conferences, he has talked about this transition from pandemic to endemic yeah. or epidemic. Endemic. E endemic. Um, where it does become like the seasonal flu, but you, you say it's still not clear. I don't think it's quite there yet. Right. Um, and 
and so to the extent, I mean, the stat we heard this morning was 10% of, of children in the UK have COVID right now. Mm -hmm. So that is still a vast level of uh, viral transmission and presence in the, in, in the country. So we just don't know yet w what the remaining drift and mutations could be. Is the government ready to scale up in the way it did before? Should another virus come along that really threatens the, the, the public? Well, a lot of the scale up has been done. So part of what our job was in 2020 was to put those plans in place. So we um, uh, basically took the existing ecosystem for vaccine manufacturing and scale up um, and nine different sites around the country mm. we have now uh, funded to scale up into much more significant That's... capability. So we've got a lot more capability here now. You talked about having someone in government that's responsible for this, yes. right? Yes. I mean, I think we should be treating it like we treat defence because, you know, we're much more likely to get a, another serious pandemic than we are to be invaded by somebody So what, a pandemic military. minister? Yes, but really serious, not just a... Cabinet minister? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And it needs to be somebody, ideally, um, uh, that comes in, I think, that needs to have that private sector experience. Have you suggested that to the PM? Yeah, yeah, of course. And what did he say? Oh, they, you know, they'll take all those suggestions. Well, ultimately, it transpires, I don't know. Do you think that we have finally killed the stereotype that science is a boy's subject? I mean, there's a lot of yeah. very, very punchy women who were absolutely instrumental in, in the whole initial COVID response. Um, no, I don't. And I think it's partly because um, we don't... Uh, teach our kids in school as to what the what you can do in science. So people, I still think, think of scientists as being, you know, men in white coats. Well, actually, it's not that. If you think about what we're dealing with in technology, whether it's phone apps or cyber security or how do you deal with climate change, and as soon as you start saying, well, all of those are underpin, underpinned by scientific understanding, actually, that's what's going to get people excited because these new, you know, younger people now, they absolutely want to help um, save the world. Do you think it's a instance that the people heavily involved in um, this vaccine were women? I think women are very good at problem solving and just getting on with it. As you did. Well look, thank you so much. Thanks Kate for talking to me. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Enjoyed Thanks that. for having me. Well that's all for today's show. Thank you to all our guests, Vitaly Klitschko, Christopher Steele and Dame Kate Bingham. And if you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can listen to the Beth Rigby Interviews podcast. A new episode will be available later tonight. Each week, I take a look at the highlights of the interviews and there's some extra behind-the-bit scenes set in too. That's on the Sky News app or wherever you get your podcasts.